Word of prayer. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you for this time that we have together. I ask you to help us tonight, help us to grow in you and help us to have full understanding. We'll be careful to give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. We're going to start on, it's actually probably three weeks ago notes. Um, I can't remember actually when I started the rapture section. Uh, but we're going to be starting at the doctrine of imminence. And remember, we're, we're dealing with the concept of the pre-tribulation rapture, which means that the church is translated or caught up prior to the tribulation period. And I want to just, some of this will go kind of fairly quickly because we've talked about some of it already. Uh, some of it, we're going to talk about it a little bit more even tonight. And so, uh, but these are reasons why I believe that the church will be raptured prior to the tribulation period starting or what is people known as the pre-tribulation rapture theory. So the doctrine of imminence, that word imminence has to do with at any moment coming or coming at any moment and uh, the interesting, the reason why this doctrine is so powerful is because it is the primary doctrine of the first church. Uh, all through, even into the Old Testament to a certain extent, when you, if you consider the Gospels or the time of Christ on earth as still Old Testament, which it really is, but even he, his main message was, you need to live like the Lord's going to come back at any time. And uh, uh, there were many signs throughout history for Israel that would precede the second event, advent, so uh, advent, so that the nation might be in expectancy of the coming of the Messiah. So when you read passages like Matthew 13, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, uh, even the disciples asking in Acts chapter one. Or earlier, they they asked him, you know, what are the signs going to be? Well, when Jesus is releasing those signs, he's not talking to the church. He's talking to Israel because the church was not in existence yet, even when Jesus, the church didn't come into existence until Acts chapter two. So it was after Christ came, after he died, after he was buried, after he was resurrected and ascended, then he came back to the church in spirit form, if you will, to establish this new program, if you will, that he had with people, but now he has set aside Israel. And so all the signs of scripture, it's the reason why we can't get wrapped up with the concept of signs. There's too many people that, how many have ever heard this? If you've been around the church anytime, you probably have, but the signs of the times are everywhere. Okay. Well, not really. They're there, but you have to really read into them because there's really no signs for the rapture. Because the rapture is the doctrine of imminence. We should be living like the Lord could come at any moment. There's no, there's no precursor to it, okay? So when you hear the words, the signs of the times are everywhere, really what we're doing is we are stepping into the signs that are for Israel and we're trying to apply them in a certain extent to us. So for instance, because there is going to be a mark of the beast, even though we don't really know what that is yet, we can say that we're closer than ever before because we now recognize that there is the possibility of technology that will allow the Antichrist to give that mark to everybody. Okay, does that make sense? But what we end up doing is we get all these signs and confusion and fear thinking that that's talking about the rapture. And, and how many have ever heard the statement? I, I see it on Facebook all the time. You know, you, you better get right with God because he's coming soon because the signs are everywhere. Well, that's not why you should get right with God because you, you, the signs are for a different purpose. The reason we should get ready for God is because Jesus could come at any moment. And... Uh, and, and, there, and we should be living with an expectancy of him to come. So at the close of the book of Revelation, uh, John writes 
his closing prayer, if you will. And he says, even so, Lord Jesus, or come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And a lot of people think that he's talking about him returning to set up heaven, to, to blow out the adversary. He's, his prayer is just come right now. And the Lord comes in many different ways to us. He comes on Sunday when the presence of God begins to move. Okay, but his literal coming to gather us home, the rapture, if you will, can happen at any moment. And so that statement of John's that says, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, what John is really saying is, I'm going to live the rest of my life as if you're going to come back for me tonight in the next 10 minutes. Okay, does that make sense? And it shouldn't be a fearful thing. If you're having a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing to fear. That should be exciting. Okay? Um, it, it's, it's like, well, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, but the church is the bride of Christ. What bride and groom aren't excited to see one another on their wedding day? Okay? That's the feeling that we as the church should have to see Jesus. Not a fear like, oh my God, he's going to come today. But a fear and an and awe and a reverence and an excitement that says, I could see Jesus face to face today. And that's the doctrine of imminence. Um, the early church lived in a constant expectation that Jesus would show up. Um, I will tell you this. This was such a powerful doctrine, even into the 1900s, that a lot of our denominations, churches, if you will, ignored the concept of education. Education was a mid-1900s that it started popping up all over, but in the early 1900s, they, they were only worried about two things, the rapture taking place and finding enough people to, to win to the Lord because the rapture was taking place. And so these churches focused solely, these, the people of the early 1900s, focus solely on the concept of him coming back and we need to have as many people ready for him for when he comes back that we, we kind of just set to the back burner the concept of education. And what I mean by education, I'm talking about like a college level, you know, the colleges that spring forth and then all of a sudden the seminaries, well now there's a bazillion seminaries out there because people have realized that even though he may come at any moment, we have to do whatever we can as if he's not. Okay, occupy until he comes. Live until he comes. Establish until he comes. This doctrine of imminence, therefore, forbids the participation of the church in any part of the 70th week. It's the reason why the church will be gone before the rapture takes place, because... If I am here as the church, or if the bride of Christ is here, the moment that the Antichrist makes a peace pact with Israel, which Daniel prophesies that that's the starting of the 70, uh, 70th week, that means from that point forward, I can measure when Jesus is coming. Okay, so that's why I believe it's pre-trib, and that's why the doctrine of imminence is so Strong. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to read just one verse there. According to verse 3, you can kind of read, well, most, most theologians will tell you that Paul is writing to the Thessalonians here because there was a doctrine or a teaching that had come out that the rapture had already taken place. And the Thessalonica church feared that the rapture had already taken place. And so he writes in chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, which was the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Okay? The, the rapture will not take, or has not taken place yet, because this hasn't happened, as soon as the rapture takes place. Now read down to verse number 7 of 2 Thessalonians 2, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay, that's the what that mystery of iniquity is, the hidden things of the weakness or the sin or the shortcomings 
It's already at work. It's just not exposed yet. So the iniquity of the Antichrist. Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard, read in, uh, I think it's First Peter, that there already are Antichrists on the world, in the earth? Okay, anything that is Antichrist is the spirit of Antichrist. But there is a man, a beast coming. Uh, the man of, uh, according to verse 3, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, we see down in verse number 8, the wicked one shall be revealed. Okay, so the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Just pick up the newspaper. Everything that goes against Christ is the spirit of Antichrist. It's Antichrist. Okay, and so what he's saying is the mystery of Antichrist or the mystery of sin, the hidden things, it's already happening in the world. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay, what that is telling us is that there is something that's holding back the exposure of the wicked one. The, it, it's holding back, it's restraining, if you will, the hidden sins, the hidden spirits of Antichrist that are ready to rise up. So something is holding it in place. And uh, I, I believe that, that the only thing that that could be is the Holy Ghost. The church is the, the, church is the, the house, if you will, the temple of the Holy Ghost. So you could say the church, but it's, it's really not us that's holding him back. It's the fact that the Holy Spirit is in the church. Okay, and that 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 his spirit, the spirit of the Lord is the restrainer. And so the only thing that can be revealed by the adversary right now has to go through Jesus. Okay, but when he takes his body, the bride of Christ, the church, and he removes us, it will let the hidden iniquity or the spirits of Antichrist be exposed and they can step onto the scene because there is no more restrainer. Does that make sense? So it's the reason why I also believe in the pre-tribulation raptures because I believe that the church, which is the house of the Spirit of God in the world today, is the thing that is holding back or restraining the the revelation or the exposure. There's some notes on that table, Dwayne, the notes for tonight. And uh, that, that restrainer is holding it in place before the Antichrist can rise to power. But there's coming a day when that restrainer, that spirit is released or, re or pulled back. This word says until it's out of the way or taken out of the way. Well, what's taken out of the way? The church. When the church is taken, that's why I say to people, you think it's bad now in the world, just wait till the church isn't here. You think we're living in a bad, evil time right now, just wait until the church isn't here. The church is holding back the tide of all of the junk that the, the enemy can, can release. Okay, does that make sense? And so there's this restraining work of the Spirit that will continue until the church is gone. So the day of 1 Thessalonians 4, when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That moment of time, we're caught up, we're taken out. The restrainer is removed, and that's when everything is going to start just exploding. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so I'm at number 11 in your notes. This is still from last week. We haven't gotten to those new ones yet. Uh, Dwayne and Carol. Um, and, and I'm only going to brush over this because the new notes amplify what I'm going to mention here. There is a necessity, the reason why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and not a mid or post is because there is an interval of time that the church needs before it returns with the Lord. See, a post-tribulationist will tell you that the church is raptured and immediately returns with Jesus. Okay, but there's some stuff that has to happen in the interval uh, for instance, and we're going to talk about it in just a little bit, but the judgment seat of Christ, and I've given you some scriptures. I'm just going to mention them now because that's the new notes you picked up. We'll get into this a little bit deeper. Uh, there is a presentation of the church to the Lord in Ephesians and in Jude, and then there's the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. And those things make it of necessity that the church is gone and there is a period of time 
between the time that the church is raptured and the church returns with the Lord. Okay, so that's another reason why I believe in the pre-tribulation of the of the church, uh, pre-tribulation rapture of the church. So now, yes. Um, back to the restrainer. Um, the restrainer, meaning the Holy Spirit within within the uh, the believers, when they are raptured, we know that there will be those who will come to Christ during the tribulation. Are you saying that you do not believe that the Holy Spirit will be here on earth? The so Holy Spirit will be here, but the church won't. And, the, <laughs> and we're going to talk about the saints that are saved during the tribulation. Yes. They're not saved into Christ. They're saved into spiritual Israel. Oh, okay. Okay. Because the church is already gone. So, but back to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is gone out of the earth. I believe the restraining aspect of it. I believe this because he's the spirit is omnipresent. I'm, it's, I mean, it's everywhere at all times. But from the beginning of time, God had, has chosen a specific entity, thing, item, something to be the main contact between humanity. So for Adam and Eve, it was the cool of the day. Whatever that means, that was the Bible says God met with him in the cool of the day. Okay, after all of the mess that Adam and Eve caused, God eventually started to, until Moses, and then he created the tabernacle plan. So then that Ark of the Covenant became the symbolic piece of furniture that represented the connection between God and man. Okay, and then, then Jesus comes, as God comes as a man. The little baby of Bethlehem, that is now the contact point. While he was on earth, the contact point to humanity and God was the man Christ Jesus, one mediator between God and man. Well, when he was ascended, there's only one contact point, if you will, for the Lord now in the world, and that's the church. We're, we're the represent. So if somebody, and when I say church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the, the, the believers that have been born of the water and of the spirit they make up the ecclesia or the gathering of believers uh, to be the church. So if somebody on their own in the middle of nowhere finds repentance and the Lord blesses them and baptizes them with the spirit and, and they're, born into the, they're born into the church, okay, they're born into the bride. Well, when the rapture takes place, the bride disappears. So now anybody that comes to the Lord comes to the Lord like they did back in the Old Testament. And so I do believe the Holy Ghost will always be everywhere. The Lord will be there because the Lord's going to be dealing with Israel during the tribulation. Um, but I will say that, that that point of contact, and maybe that's why the Lord is going to allow the temple to be rebuilt and the sacrifices to resume because for the Jew, they may go back to an Ark of the Covenant kind of mindset for their connect point with God. And so it's just, it's a little bit different, but I believe that the, the church is the housing mechanism of the spirit right now, just like the Ark of the Covenant. We don't need the Ark of the Covenant now. We don't need the altars of sacrifice now because we are the altar of sacrifice. We are the building. We are the temple. We are the holy place of God. And that's why it's so powerful when we gather together because uh, well, Paul tells Timothy to stir up the gift. Well, when we're all together, the gift that is housed within us gets stirred up. And when God gets stirred up, anything can take place. Sir, uh, then Gentiles, there'll be some Gentiles still saved during that. I believe so. Time. I believe so. The, the difference, the biggest difference to me is it's not going to be real easy. Right. And they're going to pay an, a huge, huge price. Um... It's the reason why most of the people that come out of the tribulation are considered to be uh, martyrs. Because uh, that, that, and that statement that I have mentioned a diff few different times in Revelation where it says they overcame by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb, th that word of the testimony can, doesn't happen now. We, we don't become overcomers because we testify that we're His. We overcome because we have Him. Okay. Now, our the word of our testimony releases us. It'll it'll it's set free and it brings blessing to us. 
But you don't get to heaven. You don't get to Jesus today by just saying, you know, this is my testimony. Okay. But in the tribulation saints, they'll have two things. The blood of the lamb will still have to apply to them. But the word of their testimony, when the word of their testimony gets released, chances are that means they're getting ready to be killed. Okay. Let me give you, before we move on, some distinctions. This is number 12, distinctions between the rapture and the second advent because people can get confused with this. Okay, the rapture, the translation, entails the removal of all believers while the second advent entails the appearing or the manifestation of Jesus. Okay, so let me just stop right there real quick and say, when you hear teachers, preachers talk about the second coming of the Lord, you have to ask them, which part of that do you mean? I believe the whole concept is second coming, but there's a difference between the rapture and the, he's coming twice, okay? He's coming to get his bride. He's not coming to the earth though, okay? That's why the Bible says we're gonna go up in the air to him. But at the, at the second advent, he's going to put his feet on Mount Olive, Mount of Olives, and there's going to be a great price to pay. Okay, in the rapture, the saints are caught up, while at the second advent, Jesus returns to earth. Just said that. In the rapture, Christ comes to claim a bride, while at the second advent, he returns with the bride. Okay, he returns. He's, he comes at the rapture. He comes and collects the bride unto himself, and then seven years later, he's going to return, and the Bible says we come with him. Okay? We come with him. Okay, it's another reason why I don't believe in post-tribulation because I think God, it, it's, well, remember the passage of the scripture where God says, your, your, your earthly fathers know how to give good gifts. How much better does your heavenly father know how to give? What kind of a gift would it say? Come on home. Oh, we're not coming home. We're leaving. Okay, that to me, it just goes against the concept of, of the gift. So he's going to bring us home. There's some things that are going to happen, and then we're going to come back with him, and the bride will be revealed. The rapture results in the removal of the church and the inception of the tribulation, while the second advent results in the establishment of the millennial kingdom. The rapture is imminent, while the second advent is preceded by a multitude of signs. Okay, it's a lot of this we've already kind of mentioned, so we'll just kind of go through it. The rapture is obviously a message of comfort. In fact, verse 18 of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, wherefore comfort one another with these words, right after he talks about the rapture. And the second is accompanied by a message of judgment. Uh, what, a, what a drastic difference. The rapture is related to the program, eschatologically speaking, to the program for the church, while the second advent is related to the program for Israel and the rest of the world, or the unbelievers of the world. The rapture is a mystery. It's not really, it wasn't, it wasn't prophesied really in the Old Testament because they didn't see that church age, the present age, remember. They saw the age and the age to come, and uh, where the second advent is in both testaments. At the rapture, believers are judged, while at the second advent, the Gentiles and Israel are judged. Remember, there's a difference now. So I've even done this, okay? I've done this, and I, and I shouldn't. When I'm preaching or teaching, I'll say, how many Jews are in the, in the church today? And you maybe get one. How many Gentiles? And everybody raise your hand. The, the, in all reality, there is no Jew nor Gentile in the church, Okay, we're, we're, we're Christian. We're, we're totally, I'm not a Gentile anymore. Okay, the Lord changed me. He transformed me when I became his. Okay, so we have to remember that. That's why, that's why those that are saved in the tribulation period are the similar to those that were saved in the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, there wasn't a Christ yet. There wasn't a bride. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Elijah, all of them, none of them could be born into the bride or into Christ because Christ didn't exist yet. Uh, at the rapture, uh, this one is, 
Well, let me back up a little bit. I'm just missing some here. Uh, da, 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 da. Number 10, the rapture leaves creation unchanged while the second advent entails a change in creation. Let me tell you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is uh, the day after the rapture, the lion is still going to try to eat the antelope. <laughs> okay? But after the second advent, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. And the, so, so nature itself transitions and changes. Are you guys lost back there? Yeah. Uh, I am in not today's notes. We're still in last week's or two weeks ago. Okay, because I don't have those. Okay, Alicia knows where they're at. We handed them out actually maybe even a month ago. I can't remember how many weeks in a row we've been in the rapture area. But she can get, she knows where a copy is. Um, so I'm at number 11 at the rapture the Gentiles are unaffected while at the second advent Gentiles are judged okay and what I mean by that is again the day after the rapture the kingdoms of the world are still going to be run by Gentiles okay all of the all of the king because None of the battles have taken place yet, okay? And then after the second advent, it's going to be either Jesus on the throne or David. It's going to be the throne of David that's resurrected and going to rule and reign for those a thousand years. And so the Gentiles get judged. Okay, if you'll look through to where it says the 24 elders, number 13, And, but I'm at number 12 before that. At the rapture, the covenants that we've talked about are still unfulfilled. Okay? But at the second advent, all the covenants get fulfilled. So the Abrahamic covenant, which, which birthed, if you will, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the, the new covenant, those four covenants, when the church goes, they're not fulfilled yet, okay? Because remember, the main thing with Abraham's covenant was he's going to be a father of many nations. He's going to set up property, land, and then all the people of the earth will be blessed. Well, that's not going to happen the day after the rapture, okay? But it will the day after the second return of Christ, the second advent, if you will. Um, number 13, at the rapture, there is no particular relation to the program of God in relation to evil. Uh, in other words, evil's not judged at the rapture. In fact, evil's probably going to get more released after the rapture. But at the second advent, evil will be judged. The beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. Satan himself will be cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And so much different than what happens at the rapture. The rapture is said to take place before the wrath of God while the second advent follows it. The rapture is for believers. The second advent will affect all people. Um, so the expectation of the church at the rapture is to be taken into the Lord's presence while the expectation of Israel at the second advent is to be taken into the millennial kingdom. We say millennial kingdom only because it's a thousand years according to scripture. Um, it's really the kingdom of the Lord uh, that, that he sets up on earth. Okay? So now I want to turn to Revelation chapter 4. Read one scripture there. Revelation 4, 4. Now, I believe that in verse 1 of chapter 4 is where the rapture takes place. Okay? Uh, for the first three chapters that John is talking with the Lord, he's telling them all about the things that were and the things that, that, the things that were before John, the things that were of the time of John, and a little bit now of the present age. But at chapter 4, verse 1, there's a door that's opened in heaven, and the voice that came out says, Come up hither, and I'm going to show you the things that are after. I believe that is symbolic or significant as to the rapture of the church. 
Okay, so now go down to verse number four. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. I, these four, 24 elders are not revealed in particular in Scripture, okay? Um, so let me just tell you who they can't be first, and then I'll tell you what I believe they are. They can't be angels, okay? It's impossible for them to be angels for a couple of reasons. Number one, angels are not crowned with victor's crowns, okay? So the crown of gold at the end of that verse is the Greek word Stephanus, okay? And, and it, it, it's a crown that you receive as a reward, okay? Nor are angels ever revealed to be sitting on thrones. Thronos is the Greek word, which the throne speaks of royalty, dignity, prerogative. Those The angels never have any of that, okay? Um, and angels are not clothed in white, for judgment purposes. Okay, now they may have worn white clothing. We get, how many have ever seen? You, you dress up an angel, and what do you get? You get a white sheet and a silver halo. Okay? Okay, that, that's our idea of it. Okay? Angels, for the most part, look a lot like you and I. They represent to a certain extent. Um, there's an old song that all kinds of churches used to sing that isn't really biblical, Surprise, surprise. But says, uh, I can feel the brush of angels' wings. Okay, well, there's only certain angels that have wings and they're not walking around brushing themselves up against us. Okay, I know what the songwriter is trying to say, but, but we get these different perceptions of what they are. So there's no way that the 24 elders can be the angels. I also can't believe that these would be uh, Jews from Israel because there's coming a, in, in yet a few more days, if you will, the 144,000 that are sealed. Those are Jews, 12,000 from every tribe of Israel. Okay, so why wouldn't the writer, why wouldn't Jesus reveal the 24 as part of Israel if the hundred, in other words, he makes two dif- distinctions. There's the 24 elders, there's the 144,000 that we'll, we'll talk about, okay? So here's what I believe. I believe these elders represent resurrected, redeemed saints of the church, okay? Um, so why do, we get, why do we get the 24 elders? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Let me, first of all, say that the position... They're enthroned around the throne of God, okay? And I've given you some scriptures there, Revelation 3, John 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, that that's where the saints are going to be. And so I believe that these 24 are representative of redeemed saints. Uh, The number that it, it symbolizes, if you read Leviticus 24, you'll see that there's 24 choruses that are mentioned. Uh, and of, of all the, the groups in First Peter 2 and Revelation 1, it's only the church that can be a priesthood, okay? So the, these elders are representative. Now, can I tell you who their names are? No, I can't even tell you whether they're all male or all female. They're just elders, okay? Here's what I can tell you. It's interesting that they use the word elder here Uh, Because elder, there's a distinction very slight, and the church has missed it, okay? Let me me put it to you this way, and I'm taking kind of an aside here. But the traditional church began to use terminology that doesn't make sense to the biblical narrative. Let Let me say it just plain out. I'm not the pastor of this church, okay? We have used that title throughout the tradition that the leader of the church was the pastor, okay? And and I have to have the gift of pastoring, otherwise I'd be useless. But um, that's why there's a bunch of pastors in churches, okay? Where the biblical term that applies to me is the bishop. 
and especially in the North, and especially in Minnesota and Wisconsin and the Dakotas, they shy away from that word like it's the plague. And, uh, be, and, and, and I don't really totally know why. And there could be several reasons. But it's starting to, to come back up a little bit. Um, but I, I am, according to the scripture, the bishop, the overseer of the church. Okay? Then the elders were people that were appointed by the bishop to help minister to the church. Okay? And then the, the next group of people in Scripture were the deacons or deaconesses, and those were people that served the church in different areas under the oversight of the elders and the ultimate oversight of the bishop. So let me bring it down to our church, okay? As the bishop, I oversee the church, okay? Cheryl Perkins is the elder for our kids' ministry, okay? Jason Bertelson is a deacon in our children's ministry, now, we don't use all those terms. We're just people, okay? But the responsibility is bishop, elder, okay? So what's interesting is that they use the word in Revelation, the elders, the 24 elders, which means these are 12, 24 men and or women that are appointed to represent the ministering aspect of the church answering to the ultimate bishop who is Jesus, Okay, it's the reason why they don't use the word bishops there. Okay, so anybody, these 24 elders around the throne worshiping, I believe are those that are representing all of the saints. All of us have a ministry. All of us have a purpose. And we're all gathered around the throne worshiping. Okay. Um, what about the, the 12 apostles? Yes, it, it could be the 12 apostles too. Um that there again, it's conjecture because it never breaks down the 24 elders. But I do know this. I believe that the number 12 in scripture means government. Okay, that's the reason why. Um, well, let me even go further. One of the reasons why the disciples said that they needed to replace Judas Iscariot was because the number of 11 uh, in scripture has to do with apostasy. And they didn't want to have apostasy within the church. So they said, okay, we've got to replace them. And here's some guidelines, okay? Uh, because 12 then is the number of governments. The reason why there's 12 tribes, it's the reason why um, it, it's set up that way if you read it through Scripture. 12 stones, 12, 12 tribes, which was 12 people, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this case, the 24 is double that, which... That could be, it could be, 12 of them could be the apostles, the founding members of the church that were there in Acts chapter 12. Some of them could be uh, the apostle Paul. It could, you know, it just, the scripture doesn't reveal it. And so we really don't know. So I look at it as whoever those 24 are, it's really just symbolic of all of us that are gathered around the throne, worshiping, representing us, um, in Revelation 5, the testimony of the elders marked them as representing the church. Uh, uh, Revelation 5, uh, 9 through 10. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's got to only be the church that can testify that way. So the 24 elders to me represent, uh, and the concept of elder is a representative office. Okay, the elder, if you really look up the, the, the term for elder, if you really look up the definition, it means one that carries out the desires of another. Okay? Um, and so it's a, it's a representative type office. I believe that the church has, they have taken traditionally and put some things in place that are structurally biblical Elders, deacons, it's biblical stuff. But I'd rather not get tied up in the titles because then you, you break it down. Quite frankly, an elder can only be a man. A deacon can be a woman, but an elder can only be a man because one of the requirements of an elder is that they are the husband of one wife. Okay? According to First Timothy 2, I think it is. 
either 1 Timothy 1 or 1 Timothy 2. And, uh, or maybe even 3. It's one in those first few chapters of 1 Timothy. Um, and, and so, if you really get strictly biblical about it, but the flip side is, is because I believe it's a representative office that the fulfillment of an elder can be male or female because it all has to do with serving the purpose of another. And when the elders, so for instance, in our church, let me just give you an example of what I would classify as a specific elder is Randy Esparza. Okay. Um, he does a lot for us here at the church, but he does it all under, under my oversight. And he, when he's doing something, not that all of the ideas are mine, but he comes to me, he says, what about doing this? Can we do this? Can we do that? Let's, you know, and so, but I'm the overseer of it. I'm the one that has to protect the church in the eyes of the Lord. And then there's a whole bunch of people underneath me, and, and for lack of a better term, as elders and as deacons. Some deacons, because some of the eldership has to do with actual ministry, where the ministry of the deacon has more to do with, well, in our case, Kim and Tony are deacons. It's the physical meeting of the needs of the foods and the tables and the cleaning and the, those kinds of things. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so I believe the elders are representing us at this point in heaven, it's really all of the church. It's representing the church. That's another reason why I believe chapter 4, verse 1 is the equivalent of the rapture in, in the prophetical term. All right. Um, the re relation of the church to the governments. In the New Testament, this is important to understand why I believe in pre-tribulation. We are, as a church, instructed to pray for our government authorities, whether we agree with them or not. Whether we're Democrat, Republican, Independent or not, as a Christian, we're supposed to pray and obey the natural or the governmental authorities of the world because the Bible, if you read Romans 13 especially, they are appointed by God. They are, they are so that those in authority, our prayers have to be, let me put it to you this way, because I don't want to try to sound political. <laughs> I don't pray for our presidents or our governors or our government leaders. I never pray for them that they would do what I want them to do. I pray for them that God would speak to them and that they would hear. And not just on a governmental authority or level, but on a human, personal, get right with God kind of prayer. Lord, meet them. Draw them, because I know this, if they will ever fall in love with the Lord, it doesn't matter what policy they put out, it's going to be God-ordained and God's going to help us with it. Okay, does that, I hope that makes sense. Um, but if you notice, according to Revelation 13, 4, the government during the 70th week is controlled by Satan himself. And so if the church is in the tribulation, then God is expecting us to submit to satanic authority, which just doesn't make sense. Okay, it's the, it, if, if we're supposed to submit ourselves to the government, uh, it's bad enough doing it to somebody that is quote-unquote anti-Christian now. Can you imagine doing it to actually Satan in, in the Antichrist in the tribulation period? So that's another reason why I believe that the church will be gone. In fact, the church is never commanded or asked by God to be subject to a satanic government. And so obviously the church isn't here. Can I ask another question? Absolutely. Um, I know that our government authorities are servants of our constitution. Correct. So when they differ. Absolutely. And, and, and the bottom line with all of it is, do I obey God rather than men? Right. So if our government leaders are not doing what's right or against scripture, then we've got to come against it. But I will tell you this, part of the reason why our church was blessed through COVID, we've tripled almost through COVID. And part of the reason that was, was because we didn't thumb our nose at the government when they were doing their mandates and how to do this and how to do that. Um, and, and I honestly believe, even though I never agreed with half of what they were doing, you know, I didn't agree 
that we could only come at 25%. I didn't agree that we could only come at 50%. I didn't agree that we all had to wear masks every day because I have enough people in the medical field that the masks did very, very little, and it's been proven out, unless you had the high-tech, heavy-duty masks, okay? But we provided masks for everybody and required it when people came based off of what the, the state government was mandating. And I believe, this is just me, but I believe that God honored our church for not making a big stink about it, not trying to push the rules, not trying to... I've got friends of mine that, well, one guy took them... Now, the difference is they were in California, but uh, which was much more strict than here. But he took them all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, number one, that church is out a ton of finance. Number two, they were recognizing, they used the, the terminology to say that they were being oppressed and that they had to rise up against that government. Okay? That's between them and God. But for us here, I just believe that because we did things to the best of our ability to work hand in hand with the appointed government over us, that God blessed us. Now, have they, if, if they would have tried to hold out and say, you know, you can't preach this, you can't sing this, you can't do this, you can't pray for people, um, we would have probably had a different response than what we did because I have to obey God more than man. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, in Revelation 11, uh, verse number three, we see the two witnesses. And these witnesses, and, and this again, we're still talking about why I'm pre-tribulation, okay? The two witnesses are sent, sent specifically to Israel. And their ministry is accompanied by signs that substantiate the divine origin of their message according to Old Testament prophecies, okay? So when you compare the ministry of Elijah in 2 Kings and John the Baptist in Matthew and the two witnesses, they are almost parallel in the way that they operate, okay? They're both sent to Israel in a time of apostasy to call the nation to repentance, okay? The message is the same. The garments were the same, Elijah and John the Baptist dressed very similar uh, and their message and their ministry was very similar. In, in fact, some people will say that the two witnesses are Elijah and John the Baptist. Whether they are for sure, certain or not, you can't really tell. It says there's, at least in Revelation, you can see that there's at least one like Elijah. Okay, we don't know if it's Elijah per se. It could be because Elijah never died. Okay, John the Baptist did. John the Baptist was headless, okay? Got his head taken off. So whether or not the Lord resurrects those two to come back as the two witnesses, we don't know for certain. Uh, some theologians speculate that it's at least for sure Elijah and then maybe somebody similar to John the Baptist. Others say, well, you can't really prove it one way or the other. We just know it's two witnesses that are fulfilling the same ministry roles and appearance as Elijah and John the Baptist, okay? And uh, so they're announcing the same message, which was the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. That was their, their, their basic messages, okay? And so uh, those two witnesses let us know that that's an Israelite Jewish message. Even John the Baptist, we think he was, he was, he was making the way of the Messiah, Okay, but the religious leaders didn't see John fulfilling the ministry of Elijah in preparing the way. They thought he was a lunatic. Okay, so the Lord in this time is raising up to Israel again, two witnesses that God will use and perform miracles, but it can't be to the church because those witnesses are to Israel. So the church already has to be gone. Um. The destiny of the church, obviously the church is in the heavenlies. We're going to go and be with him. We sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It's the concept of the heavenly. But the things that happen in the tribulation are leading Israel to a kingdom that is earthly. Okay, so the church has to be gone. 
because God has already taken us to a heavenly place and he's going to deal with Israelite on an earth basis, if you will, uh, in the 70th week. And so it can only indicate that those saved during the 70th week go into the millennium while the, that we that are already born into Christ are already gone. We're, and we're going to talk about it a little bit here in just a second. Uh, I'm just going to let you read through your notes with the church of Laodicea or the message of Laodicea. The, the, the underlying principle is if he spews us out of his mouth, if all of the church is in the tribulation, that means the church gets spewed out of his mouth. But if he separates the church and the church is gone, then he deals with people that are lukewarm and he can spit them out of their mouth, out of his mouth. Okay? So the church is, to me, gone from the, before the rapture or before the tribulation period. Um, there's also going to be uh, I'm looking over at point number 20. The sealed 144,000, we've mentioned these. If the church is on the earth, they would be saved into the church, but they're not. They're set up as the remnant. They are sealed for the time of the second advent of Christ. Okay? So, and the reason that they're sealed is because God will always have a remnant with Israel. And the problem is, is when we try to put those 144,000 in the church, that means part of the church has to go through the tribulation, but the 144,000 are sealed Israelites dealing with Israel. All right. The last thing that I want to mention here, it's called the promises to the church. It's 22.22 in your notes. I know I'm skipping some things. You can go back and look at that. But he promises us in Revelation, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Okay. Number two, he's appointed us, uh, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by Jesus Christ. And then um, in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul clearly indicates that our expectation is not wrath, but the revelation of Jesus. Praise God. Is there any questions on that aspect of it? I, I kind of ran over some of it because what we're going to talk about here now is will answer some of that. But before I go into it, this will be the notes for that you picked up tonight. What time is it? 7.26. Are you serious? <laughs> we're asking too many questions. Are you serious? Okay, if that's the case, give me about five more minutes. We'll deal with this next week, the events for the church. Um, go back uh, two points, and then I'll close with this to 21. The apostasy of the period. I think I've got that in there. It would be right before the promises of the church or to the church. It's a section that says it starts with the apostasy of the period. The only organized church that's ever mentioned in the tribulation are one of two, the Jezebel system of church or the harlot system. Okay. Again, these are back into the previous notes, not the new ones from tonight. So if the church was still on earth in the tribulation, and it's not mentioned as separate from the apostate systems, it would mean that the church was a part of the apostasy. Okay? so Or part of the harlot church or the Jezebel church. Well, obviously, the church is not a part of that. So because in the tribulation period, you're only referring to the Jezebel church or you're dealing with the harlot church, uh, religious systems, we can safely assume that the church is all gone. Okay, that we're gone already. Praise God. So now let me ask you this. Is there any questions up until where we're at now? Part of that's my fault because I didn't realize I still had that much material left from last week uh, to this week. Um, next week we can start on the events that take place after the rapture for the church. Um, some of those are 
easier to understand. Some of those are, well, you're going you're gonna to see that there's some things that we're, are, we're guessing <laughs> because it hasn't happened yet and nobody's been there yet. But I believe that there's certain things that happen and again, like everything, there's certain things that we've come to try to, you'll hear spoken or preached and you won't understand if you don't understand what's actually happening. And so we're going to dig into that next week. Is there any questions about tonight? Well, that means it's really good or it's still as clear as mud and you're afraid to ask. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I'd rather stop and not rush than to rush. And, uh, you know, we've got time to go over it. And next week we'll talk about what's going to take place while tribulation starts here, what we're going to be doing as the church. And uh, that's kind of exciting. Praise God. And then maybe I'll be done enough to start talking about the tribulation. Uh, I will tell you that... We won't have service on Thanksgiving, obviously. And, uh, but I am going to probably try. It's kind of up in the air. We'll know more when my wife gets back. It kind of just depends on the praise team for the week of our Christmas concert. If we need to have that Thursday night as a practice, we'll have to postpone one week for this. That's not our plan right now. Our plan is to have... Uh, chain breakers and this, and then dress rehearsals are Friday. Uh, but we may need to pull a Thursday too. We'll have to see. It just kind of depends on how it all comes together. But we will let you know. But the concert's going to be great. She told the praise team, I think I said this on Sunday, but I'm not sure. She told the praise team, oh yeah, we're just going to kind of redo everything that we've done last year. And, and so it'll be real easy. And then she showed up for practice with seven new songs. So <laughs> half the... Yeah, so half of the night will be all new songs that you haven't heard the praise team do, and then the other seven will be ones that we've heard before. And some, but some of you probably haven't heard them because we pulled a couple of them out from like five, six years ago, and are recycling them into the, into the, into the program, if you will. So it'll be great. Praise God. Well, we love you all very much. Enjoy your afternoon or evening and afternoon tomorrow. Hopefully it doesn't rain too hard. Let's uh, just stand and we'll pray.